After the defection of a high-ranking North Korean diplomat in London in July, increasing number of North Korean elites have defected from North Korea despite the strengthened monitoring and control activities from the North. Along with the rising number of North Korean defectors during the Kim Jong-un regime, controversies have been raised over to human rights violations. Also, the North has faced a deeper diplomatic and economic isolation after its fifth nuclear test. Korea and the global society have strengthened their level of sanctions against the North by emphasizing the need to improve the human rights situations within North Korea. On today's upfront, we discuss the human rights conditions in North Korea, as well as ways to boost global cooperation to tackle this issue. An increasing number of North Korean elites have recently escaped from the North. Defection of a high-ranking North Korean diplomat in London and his family has recently made a lot of headlines. Increasing number of other high-ranking officials and even close aides to the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un have also fled their country. Unprecedented defections have also continued, including the defections by the elites. In April, North Korean restaurant workers in China, as well as North Korean workers overseas, also fled the country. The number of North Korean defectors to South Korea seemed to be stalled when Kim Jong-un first took office, but it has recently shown a continuous increase. Along with the continuing defections in North Korea, seriousness of human rights violations in North Korea has been emphasized within the global society. Gurgyokde is a state-run labor organization established in North Korea to propagate its regime. However, the long working hours are forced upon the workers, and they have received little to no pay. So, it has been strongly condemned as a slave labor. According to the report by a North Korean human rights organization, the North has even extracted a large amount of cash from housewives and young students. The Korean government has also beefed up its efforts to tackle the North Korean human rights issues. North Korean Human Rights Act finally took effect in September, 11 years after it was first introduced, and on October 10th, an archive on North Korean human rights was set up in order to preserve and manage the data on North Korean human rights situations more effectively. President Park Geun-hye has also emphasized the gravity of human rights abuses within the North and has shown a strong will to resolve the issue. 가혹한 공포 정치로 북한 주민들의 삶을 지옥으로 몰아넣고 있습니다. 북한 정권의 눈치를 보면서 북한 주민들을 방치하는 것은 포악하고 호전적인 북한 체제가 더욱 공고화되는 결과를 가져올 뿐이라는 것을 분명하게 인식하고 International community has also taken swift actions. On October 8, Samantha Power, US ambassador to the UN, made a visit to Korea. During her visit, she reaffirmed the strong will of the U.S. to actively deal with the North Korean human rights issues and to promote strengthened ties with South Korea as well. Ambassador Robert King, the U.S. Special Envoy on North Korean human rights issues from the U.S. Department of State, also made a visit to Korea and strongly emphasized the need to resolve the North Korean human rights abuses. Amid the rising concerns from Korea as well as the global society over the human rights violations in North Korea, Upfront discusses the current state of North Korea's human rights abuses, as well as necessary measures to boost cooperation with the international community. For today's discussion, we're joined by a great panel of guests in the studio. First, we're joined by Choi seok a member of uh, advisory group at the UN Central uh, Emergency Response Fund, 
who has strived hard to improve North Korean human rights conditions in the international stage. Nice to meet you. Thank you. And also, we're joined by uh, Dr. Johanna Hosanyak, uh, Deputy Director General of Citizens Alliance for North Korean Human Rights, a North Korean human rights activist from Poland. Thank you for Thank having you. me. Uh, let's start with uh, recent news. It has been in kind of a tidal wave. Uh, North Korea high-ranking uh, health ministry official has defected mm -hmm. in Beijing, and we heard about that in uh, uh, early part of October. And then we heard that there is another uh, unidentified official uh, defected from the Ministry of State Security. Now, this is uh, kind of in the core power structure of the North. So right. it seems like there is a kind of a wave of defections from high-level elites. Mm -hmm. well, what's your take on this uh, phenomenon? Um, actually, the defection, the massive uh, defection of the high-level uh, elite in North Korea is not, is not uh, actually the common phenomenon. Actually, it's an unusual situation. We consider that uh, because of this uh, uh, aggravating uh, situation of North Korean uh, economic and political uh, circumstances inside, and also the pressure coming from outside through the United Nations sanctions and also sanctions of individual countries against North Korea. And um, North Korea uh, is, uh, is not a, a, an equal uh, society uh, before the law. But the people are discriminated, uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, depending on the classes. Mm -hmm. uh, the North Korean uh, people are carefully recorded uh, the biologically or political uh, loyalty. And uh, the defection of North Korean elite means that the North Korean society is becoming unstable because of the pressure from outside. And also the internal society is now being uh, very much unstable. Right, exactly because of that, because they screen uh, people uh, very carefully, uh, depending on where, where they put them uh, in terms of living situation and also when they put uh, those officials uh, overseas, uh, it seems like it's remarkable that those elites are defecting. Now, there is another uh, high-level uh, elite uh, diplomat, actually, Tae Yong ho from London. Uh, he defected uh, recently. And it seems like this kind of high-level defections uh, have indicated, uh, as Ambassador indicated, that uh, there's uh, something going on in the North. Well, I have a little different take on that. Um, <clears throat> the high-level defections have been going on for many, many years and mm -hmm. for decades. Uh, the problem is that a majority of us did not know about that, except for very high-profile uh, persons that uh, have defected and have been living here. Many of them have been hidden in many, working for many South Korean agencies, and we didn't know even that they came. We meaning NGO, because mm -hmm. we didn't have access to them. And um, the, the difference right now is that a lot of these defections have high profile in the media. And so much more uh, people can get to know that this kind of people are also coming mm -hmm. to, to South Korea. Um, so I wouldn't say that, you know, um, this is remarkable. Uh, whenever something was going on in North, in North Korea in the past, mm -hmm. uh, whether this was after Kim Il-sung died, uh, any changes, any problems with taking over by, by Kim Jong-il, and then transition to power by Kim Jong-un, this high level defections happen. It's natural because of the transition in the system and also um, conflicts of power between uh, new people coming in and other people who might be afraid of the safety even that mm -hmm. they prefer to mm -hmm. defect. And this is why we kind of see this situation uh, right now. It's visible because it's in the media. Um, and that also, of course, has um, shows an indication that, uh, first of all, in the past 20 years, 25 years, majority of defections were those of the um, people who really uh, were at the bottom of the North Korean society, mm -hmm. those that were cut from uh, food assistance, um, from public distribution and so on, they were desperate and they had to leave country, they had right. to go to China. Uh, and uh, right now the situation might be different because after 20 years these people brought complete 
change in North Korea in terms of growing black markets, mm -hmm. the capitalist economy, and uh, also spread of information. And that means that also high level uh, officials uh, might want to defect to South Korea. Uh, in the past, they might not have been as desperate to defect. Right now, the reasons for defections might be different, either saf safety or maybe just the need to, for example, educate their children. It also happens these days that uh, uh, high-level North Korean elites want to send their offsprings to be educated at good universities in South Korea mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, so that they have a future. I see. Uh, in that sense, isn't it interesting that we've seen uh, the, those workers who, who are working in uh, who are working in, in the restaurants mm -hmm. in Beijing? They, they escaped. There are about thirteen of them uh, together. Right. They've escaped, mm -hmm. and in another instance, is from Russia. The the, the mm -hmm. construction ra laborers. They also numbered in in, in ten, eleven, uh, right. in, in groups, so to speak. Yeah. So, well, is it easier to escape? from the, the overseas locations? Uh, it's not easy actually for them because most of uh, the workers f uh, workers in, in abroad um, have families uh, back, at, back at home. Therefore, uh, they are getting money, better, uh, much more money uh, in working uh, abroad. Mm -hmm. And they have family uh, in North Korea. Therefore, it's not easy for them to, uh, to decide to, to flee uh, the country. But um, I think there is a significant uh, pressure for them that actually they are under pressure from North Korean regime to uh, contribute more money mm -hmm. what they earned to the North Korean regime. And also they are, they already, uh, they are very much exposed uh, uh, in the free uh, society uh, in, in abroad. And they mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. uh, could get access to the South Korean uh, the news and also the, 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 the movies, uh, et cetera. Therefore, they know what the freedom is and they are, so much pressure from uh, the North Korean regime. Therefore, they have no other choice but to stay uh, as, 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 as they stand. I see. Yeah. The, the, what's the significance of recent increase number of North Korean defectors, regardless of their social status? Uh, to hear more about the current state of the North Korean society, we had a chance to meet a North Korean defector who was a North Korean uh, soldier. It is Yi so chairman of North Korea Women's Union. Let's take a look. Hanjo,你到北韩内에서거의층탈북이이루어지고있고이것을북한정부가주민들한테는뭐뉴스를만들어서내보내주거나그 니들이 우리한테 이런 교육을 했는데 니들이 이제 이 나라를 버리고 가는구나 라고 하는 것은 어, 상당히 북한 주민들에게는 큰 어, 놀라움이죠 이거는 그러니까 뭐냐면 어, 우리와 북한을 앉아서 같이 지키자라고 했는데 네가 앞에서 우리를 어, 지키자고 했던 사람이 탈북했다 이거는 뭐냐면 나도 가도 되느냐 어, 이런 식으로 작용할 수 있다는 라 거죠 국가가 쌀을 어느 날 보니까 배급이 끊기면서 쌀을 안 줬고 그 다음 시장에 나서 종사를 하다 보니까 한국 드라마를 접하게 됐고 한국 문화를 접하게 된 겁니다. 그러니까 드라마를 딱 보면서 어 북한이 세상에 제일 사, 잘 산다고 했는데 드라마를 보니까 아니 자본주의라고 하는 그러니까 북한의 사회주의에 비교해서 자본주의를 가장 그 인간 생지옥이라고 교육을 하는데 그 자본주의가 오히려 더잘 살더라라는 거죠. 어 지금 대한민국에 온 탈북민 3만 명 속에서 여성이 3, 70%입니다. 여성이 더 많이 왔죠. 이게 뭐냐면 북한 내에서 여성이 왜 많이 오느냐 그만큼 북한 내 여성 인권 문제가 심각하다는 라 겁니다 실제 가족의 생계 문제 국가가 배급을 책임지고 국가가 쌀을 나눠주겠다는 라그 제도가 지금 없어졌기 때문에 여성들이 나와서 가족의 생계를 책임지잖아요 그 다음 아동 문제 길거리에서 지금 먹을 게 없어 굶어 죽어 가고 있는 꽃제비 애들이 제일 지금 많이 나고 있는 것이 북한이다라는 거죠 그 이게 뭐냐면 제가 대한민국 보니까 여성이나 아동에 대한 복지 문제를 사회적인 약자라고 하면서 엄청나게 지금 시책이 이어지고 있고 그것도 실행하기 위한 NGO 단체들이 있고 얼마나 그 뉴스거리가 되고 얼마나 이게 이제 문제가 됩니까? 근데 북한에서는 여성이나 이런 아동에 대해서는 단한 번도 
한 것이 없고 뭐라고 하냐면 혁명의 한쪽 수레바퀴를 담당했다라는 거죠. 이거는 뭐냐면 혁명한 데서는 필요한데 대신 인권 문제는 우리가 모르겠다라는 거 아닙니까? 그래서 저는 이런 문제가 정말 심각하다고 라 생각을 합니다. 뭐 well, we just heard in the interview about the North Korean situations, um, uh, Dr. Hozniak, you made a visit to Kaesong, uh, maybe not to the main part of it, but could you describe as far as you know what the human rights situation is in North Korea right now? Human rights situation has not changed for many decades. And um, one thing only that has changed is the international pressure and mm. international knowledge about uh, what has been happening uh, in North Korea, inside the country. Uh, for many years, for many decades, North Korea being even a member of the UN system was able to uh, go with complete impunity and hide what has been happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. And whichever um, human rights we will touch, whether this is right to food, uh, a right to uh, f move freely, freedom of expression, uh, a right to life, um, all of these rights are violated in, inside the country. Uh, and the basic, um, the basic um, system that was established in North Korea, and Ambassador Chen mentioned about that, was this kind of political caste system that allowed North, uh, North Korean elites to divide um, people into three classes and mm -hmm. several categories. So if you are classified as a loyal one, you always had a bet, uh, better access to um, necessities and also um, good education and also um, job and so on. And if you were classified as hostile, even though you were a child, but this was a guilt of your fathers or grandfathers, mm -hmm. then there was no future for you in North Korea. Uh, on the contrary, it was also a dangerous situation because at times where North Korea was increasing control, it also started to develop the concentration camp, political prison camp system. And many of these people, together with the whole families, were relocated uh, to these concentration camps. So I think one of the major violations that are happening is this control system and also concentration camps that are in in North Korea, the fact that children are even being born there, that are living there, that people don't know outside world, that they mm -hmm. are exposed, they are machines only working uh, and uh, are really, um, they are not the, considered as a, as a members of society. They will never be able to really be re released. Mm -hmm. This is uh, something that, you know, has, hasn't happened um, in other countries, mm -hmm. we had this um, we had this concentration camps and political prison camps, gulags in Soviet Union. It wasn't to that scale. Uh, the right. concentration camps during Nazi uh, period during World War II, there were children there, but this was short period of time. And here we are talking about 50 years mm -hmm. of of a system of control where millions of people perished in this kind of system. Uh, mm. Inhumane, completely inhumane. I see. In this situation, Ambassador Choi, isn't it a pretty tough situation because the North Korea is a closed off country? Mm. Um, we normally rely on the, the testimonies and experiences of the defectors, and probably that's a little bit skewed because uh, of their situation. Probably they uh, in the kind of a, the, the worst situation in that, uh, in that society. So how do we find out about the real situation and what's your take on the, the human rights situation over there? Right. Um, in, in order to um, investigate the crimes, if, if there are, then actually we have to get access to the crime scene mm -hmm. directly. That is the best way. But in the reality, it is not easy to get access to North Korea. Um, when the uh, United Nations Commission on Inquiry on North Korean Human Rights started uh, its work in 2013, they just requested um, China and, and North Korea uh, to allow them to visit uh, the North Korea. And then I uh, would like to meet with the officers and then the people on the ground. 
but their request was, uh, of course, rejected. Mm. And uh, the chairperson of the commission, um, the Michael Kirby, the Australian judge, decided to have uh, different, uh, different approaches. He just uh, decided to have a series of interviews with North Korean defectors. Mm. And at the same time, he had also hearing, uh, open hearing and then closed hearing in order to get uh, broadest possible uh, information from, from the people who had experience of North Korean human rights violations. Uh, that is, uh, I think, the second best option uh, we can take at the moment. And on top of that, uh, we have also information we can get through uh, technologies, mm. uh, satellite images, and also the GPS. The modern technology can also reveal the situation uh, of North Korean concentration, concentration camps and also the changes of North Korean policies against the uh, human rights protections. Mm -hmm. the, the, there is a kind of a the nationwide, uh, the extraction of cash, North Korea has uh, almost uh, extracted almost one billion dollars a year uh, from the people, well, not only the, the, the workers, but also students and also a, a, a housewives as well. Now, how is this possible in the, in the first place? And what are they using this money for? Actually, um so the purpose is quite clear, actually, in order to maintain this authoritarian regime, actually, these uh, leaders uh, should uh, get the money and to appease uh, the people who are, f uh, who are following them, mm -hmm. and also to suppress, uh, actually, uh, the other group of people inside of the North Korea. And they are also using uh, the money collected from the people inside the North Korea and then uh, the North Korean workers outside um, uh, to uh, utilize the money to uh, support the development of uh, the weapons of mass dis destructions, the mm -hmm. missile development, and also the nuclear uh, bomb testings. Uh, it's quite clear. Uh, for example, um, outside of North Korea, uh, even uh, North Korean uh, embassies, um, they, are, uh, they have a quota to, uh, to pay uh, the money uh, back to uh, the North Korean regime. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, it's, uh, it's quite pressing actually for North Korean uh, the diplomats uh, working outside, and uh, they could not uh, earn the money because they are not business people. But they are uh, in order to uh, fill up the quota uh, for contribution back home, they have to uh, smuggle. They have to get engaged with uh, illegal uh, illegal actions uh, outside of North Korean countries. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, there's a system that was state sponsored. Uh, labor that uh, a lot of times is illegal, and you mentioned about the opium farm uh, that uh, yes. ostensibly for the export purposes. Yes, in order to get hard, hard currency and then uh, transfer the money back home. Mm -hmm. yeah. So one of the ways to this, the apply the sanctions would be to have that money sources or the, the, the money laundering uh, schemes to be either uh, blocked off and probably that's one of the reasons why there's economic sanctions on the financial sector as we talked about. Yeah, economic, economic sanction by United Nations or other, other, other individual countries uh, may uh, give more pressure for uh, those North Korean agencies working outside because it, it was getting more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, under that pressure, actually, North Korean elite uh, officers working outside um, are under uh, frustration. Actually, uh, they could not uh, get the money through the illegal actions uh, because of the strength and uh, sanctions by international organizations. And they have uh, reconsidered actually what to do. And uh, actually, I think that is uh, one of the motivation they uh, have decided uh, to, uh, to flee the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. So from the overseas locations, because of this um, the allotted responsibility to to pay the money, yeah. uh, I guess that becomes an extra burden on them. At the same time, uh, you know, however little money they earn, it goes a long way in North Korea. Mm -hmm. So many of these people want to work abroad and want to come back with this money to have better life in North Korea. Simply, I think there are there are uh, there is always a second, uh, you know, side to the coin, and we have to look at the. 
uh, ability of the North Korean system to really avoid the you know um, results of the sanctions. I, 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 I am really skeptical whether the economic or financial sanctions can really work on North Korea given the Chinese support and and also what is happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, there is still a lot of money flowing through different routes to, to North Korea. So um, I don't think that, that this can be um, fully stopped and I don't think that this no North Korean workers abroad is such a substantial amount to what they can earn otherwise. Mm. Uh, and I think we have to look at that as well. But um, for example, to tell you the, the black markets, uh, how North Korea started to use the fact that women became so entrepreneurial that they started to provide for their families and earn money. Right. There is a um, women's league in North Korea. There is a league for everything, of mm -hmm. course, um, uh, this collective mind um, again. And uh, women very often have to uh, simply donate money for even military constructions. Mm -hmm. I, I had mm -hmm. interviewed um, 60 women in 2013 who escaped just after 2012, and they were talking that that um, that very often they have to provide this money. So right now, these women are uh, women are looked as potential source of money mm. because they are earning mm. this on the black market, and this is how the system is also um, having financial resources. Uh, so I think you know this uh, North Korean system has been smart enough to fool the outside world and fool its society for such a long time that they, it, it may find other ways mm. Um, mm. to sponsor um, the type of uh, you know, activities they do. Uh, recently, President Park Geun-hye, in, in her speech on the day of Arm, uh, Armed Forces Day, she practically invited uh, North Koreans to defect. Mm -hmm. And um, she said that they come to uh, this side where uh, the, the freedom is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And of course, North Korea predictably uh, countered with the, the sharp criticism. Now, uh, uh, some people say that, well, why aggravate North Korea like that? Uh, mm -hmm. But there might have been some uh, the strategic uh, reasons why she made that speech. What's your take on that? I think the president uh, boxed a statement inviting uh, North Korean defectors uh, uh, actually, uh, to South Korea is uh, just uh, um, the stressing uh, the, the current fact uh, that actually South Korea already uh, accepted uh, all North Korean uh, defectors coming in to South mm -hmm. Korea actually without any any conditions. Therefore, she uh, simply uh, re-emphasized that uh, Korea is open uh, uh, to the North Korean defectors to come in. Uh, it's a bold statement. And um, actually, there is no fundamental changes of the policy. Um, when she made um, uh, a, a bold statement uh, when she visited uh, after her uh, inauguration to, to Germany, uh, she just uh, stated that actually uh, agenda for humanity uh, when she was talking about uh, um, the, 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 uh, the Korean uh, peninsula policies, she just uh, stated uh, agenda for humanity. Mm. Uh, which means uh, actually the protection of human rights in North Korea is, uh, uh, is paramount important. And she also continued to uh, support uh, humanitarian assistance to North Korean people. The legal approaches uh, have been constantly made in Korea in order to tackle the human rights issues in the North. And in September, the North Korean Human Rights Act finally became effective after 11 years since it was first produced, introduced uh, back in 2005. To hear more about the newly enforced law, we had a chance to meet uh, with uh, Lee Jong-hun, newly appointed Korean ambassador for North Korean human rights. Well, leg the legislation has um, several components to this. One is the establishment of the, the Records Center at the Unification Ministry who turn over the materials to the Justice Ministry for it's, so it's a repository of all the records collected on human rights violations and who might be committing these uh, violations. So that's a very important legal step in dealing, in dealing with the North Korean human rights issue. 
As I mentioned, we have the foundation that will also be housed under the Unification Ministry. That has not been set up as yet, um, but it will be very important moving forward as a support base uh, for all those activities being conducted by the human rights uh, activists and NGOs, um, providing budget for whatever they, you know, that they may be doing. Up to this point, a lot of the Korean NGOs have had to rely on the, on the U.S. funding uh, f uh, to conduct these um, uh, you know, conferences, forums, projects um, regarding North Korean human rights. Now we're able to provide that uh, within Korea, so that's a good thing. So I hope that those NGOs and civic organizations, not only within Korea, but throughout the world, in the U.S., in Europe, uh, will benefit uh, from the establishment of this, uh, of this uh, foundation. Change. Change in North Korea. Improvement in North Korean human rights conditions. Um, this is not something that we're expecting an overnight change. It will be incremental. It will be frustrating. But as long as we're able to progress, to a certain extent and see a gradual change in North Korea where there is an Im actual improvement in the conditions of human rights violations, um, then I think the, the purpose of the act would have been served. The violations are referred to by the United Nations finding as crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity is one of the worst crimes in international law. It's up there with genocide. So crimes against humanity and genocide is almost the same thing. And UN is saying that crimes against humanity is being conducted in North Korea. So, and this is happening to our own people in the North. So for us to sit idly by um, is not right. Uh, the United States in June has come up with a very strong sort of sanctions list, which included Kim Jong Un, which is a which is a very significant significant step. So I don't know what it will take, but I think it's uh, it's only right if we are going to lead in this campaign um, to to bring about a change in North Korean human rights. We really need to take concrete steps to show the world that Korea is at the forefront in tackling this issue. I will add that we can no longer look at the North Korean human rights issue from the perspective of inter-Korean relations. That's very myopic. That's like, you know, the old saying in Korea, frog in a well. That's the kind of approach. You cannot put the North Korean human rights issue in a box of the Korean Peninsula and try to politicize it. It's a global issue. It is a universal issue. And we have to approach it as such. There is no left or right. There is no ruling party, opposition party. It is a universal atrocity being conducted on our own people and we should deal with it as such. And if that takes some unilateral sanctions measure, then so be it. I think it's all long overdue. Let's talk a little bit about North Korea Human Rights Act, which just passed, and mm -hmm. it's been a long time coming, 11 years. Uh, now, what kind of changes do you expect, Ambassador Cho? Um, uh, I can say yeah, the three things. Uh, number one uh, is uh, the act um, decided to establish uh, human rights foundations. Uh, in order to promote North Korea's human rights situations. Actually, there are uh, many ways actually for the foundation to support the human rights situation improvement and also the, uh, the promotion of the humanitarian assistance. Mm -hmm. And the second uh, is the establishment of uh, North Korean Human Rights Information Center or Data Center, I don't know actually the correct name, mm -hmm. in order to accumulate um, the cases of human rights violations 
uh, through interviews and, and hearings, uh, all other sources uh, they can get. Uh, and um, this information uh, accumulated would be a good basis uh, for Korea and then uh, other international community to work together to improve North Korean human rights. Mm -hmm. And third one is, uh, we just as we heard, um, the appointment of a uh, special ambassador for North Korean human rights. Uh, Professor Lee uh, worked for the, uh, the human rights uh, uh, ambassador uh, uh, in, in, in Korea, but actually his title as ambassador for North Korean human rights uh, is much more upgraded title mm. uh, with which uh, he can uh, work with uh, um, at the foreign countries uh, in order to promote North Korean human rights. I see. Okay. So there, there, this is a domestic law, but by appointing an ambassador, uh, mm -hmm. it does it seem like we, the Korean government is uh, gearing more towards international cooperation in that regard? Yes, uh, we have uh, an official focal point to represent uh, the Korean uh, government point of view. I see. Yeah. Doctor, from an NGO's point of view, this law, uh, what does that signify? Um, first of all, the law is very symbolic for NGOs. NGOs mm -hmm. maybe did not have many expectations of what uh, the law can do for us and, and our work or how it can strengthen, but it's, it's very symbolic in sending the message to North Korea. Secondly, it's coming at the right time, finally, mm -hmm. where um, NGOs like my NGO, Citizens Alliance, established UN Commission of Inquiry for DPRK. And that commission um, announced that crimes against humanity have been conducted in North Korea. And um, the f resolution that followed both at the Human Rights Council and General Assembly uh, is calling for a re referral of the leadership to International Criminal Court. Uh, it also, uh, General Assembly resolution suggested uh, briefings at the UN Security Council. And these briefings happened already for the last two years. Uh, and we hope this year in December there will be another official briefing at the Council. Mm. I think um, because of the Commission of Inquiry, that resolution also um, set up the UN office, a uh, field office. And that mm -hmm. structure has been, that office has been opened uh, in Seoul and mm. has been operating, operating since last year. Also documenting with a view and monitoring with a view of bringing about accountability and justice in the long term. So we think that uh, this kind of initiatives like Human Rights Act, especially the archives, which should mm -hmm. be, uh, in our opinion, under the Ministry of Justice, um, would strengthen this capacity for a future criminal justice proceedings against um, those that uh, violated um, or committed human rights uh, uh, crimes against humanity or, for example, crimes of genocide. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that means there, there, there will be a lot more data uh, collected for future actions. Yes. It's a collection and the accumulation of evidence of the human rights violations for future actions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, not only that, the U.S. has put Kim Jong-un and uh, other uh, high-ranking officials in the list, blacklist, of uh, uh, charging them with uh, the human rights abuses. Now, do you think this will make a difference in terms of the, this is an added the devices to, to pressure the North Korea uh, in terms of you know, their, their provocations and uh, also uh, in the, specifically in the field of uh, human rights? Do you think that effectiveness will uh, come about? Um, These kind of measures are, first of all, related to the recommendations done by Commission of Inquiry for the PRK. Mm -hmm. And um, the NGOs and international communities moving forward um, with um, accountability track and the responsibility for the crimes that have been committed. One of the ways is also putting sanctions on certain people that have been responsible, that have been in direct chain of command uh, for giving orders to, uh, you know, and committed those crimes. So, uh, or you can link somehow the decision making to them. And this is a typical kind of measure that international community can do, uh, mm -hmm. including that when these people, for example, travel outside abroad, uh, some countries may um, evoke the universal jurisdiction in order to mm -hmm. arrest such people that are potentially could be put in front of the 
um, um, international tribunal, for example. So these measures are sending a strong message that despite of the fact that um, you know, there is China and Russia protecting North Korea at the Security Council. There are still many different avenues uh, of how to bring about justice for what has happened in terms of human rights violations in North Korea. Mm -hmm. well, I, what do you think about, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just would like to add uh, what Joanna just said. Um, when uh, we are talking about the North Korean um, human rights violations, actually uh, there must be uh, the suppressor and then mm -hmm. uh, victims. And uh, uh, the reason why uh, the international community uh, would like to list up uh, the main uh, uh, violator, perpetrator of the human rights violation, separating from uh, ordinary people who are suppressed by this, uh, the, the chain of command of human rights violation. Uh, just as Joanna said, um, in order to separate uh, suppressor, the perpetrator, and then victims. Mm -hmm. I think the listing up uh, is a very important actions actually uh, for us to do for uh, for uh, future uh, uh, the prosecution uh, of actions uh, uh, taken by uh, these uh, perpetrators. And second, uh, this action, this separation, would also give uh, some comfort for uh, the people who are suppressed, who are not uh, joined in suppressing uh, the ordinary North Korean people, but, uh, but they are suppressed by them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in order for them that actually uh, uh, we are immune from uh, the, the criticism of the international community. And uh, this kind of actions would be uh, very much beneficial for the future. Uh, once uh, Korea would be unified, mm -hmm. then uh, the unified Korea should also consider uh, the issue of the reconciliation. I see. Um, then actually we have to separate um, the victims and mm -hmm. the perpetrators mm -hmm. from the beginning. So that lays a groundwork and not only yeah. uh, in, in this time when there, there is a, a human rights violation has happened, but afterwards when the unif unification happens. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, interesting, as you, as you mentioned, that the, the, in terms of collaboration among the, the international community, Russia and China have a little slightly different uh, stances, uh, specifically in China, a Chinese official said uh, in so many words, that this kind of sanctions, human rights sanctions, uh, should not uh, interfere with the humanitarian uh, efforts. Uh, I think it sounds good, but I think there is a nervous reactions about the human rights issue uh, even becoming one of the weapons or becoming one of the issues. Is that a fair characterization? Um, yes and no. Uh, the the attitude of China uh, and Russia vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, North Korean human rights issues has been changed, I think, uh, mm -hmm. because um, during uh, the discussions in the Human Rights Council in Geneva, the China and, and Russia did not object the adoption of uh, uh, the bold resolution which contains the establishment of the COI and which also adopted uh, the report of the COI after one year of uh, work. Mm -hmm. In that sense, uh, China and, and Russia, Russian attitude toward North Korean uh, human rights has been changed in positive ways, in rel relatively positive ways. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are hearing that uh, the China uh, was not happy that the uh, international community is uh, um, uh, naming uh, and shaming the, the leader of uh, North Korea. Mm -hmm. Uh, finger pointing North Korean leader uh, in, uh, in the human rights violations. Uh, but overall, uh, the, the Chinese attitude uh, of a human right, um, uh, North Korea's human rights violation uh, has been uh, slowly changing, I think. I see. Uh, do you see the same kind of change? Um, I'm not sure if we can talk about really change, change, because um, countries of um, this kind of system, um, those that have um, a lot of violations to hide, usually mm -hmm. are objecting against uh, raising any human rights I issues, especially Ambassador Trek can talk about it, what is happening usually in Geneva on the, uh, at the Human Rights Council Forum. Um, but 
Um, I think China was simply after so many years and Russia pushed to the corner, corner where they could not defend anymore North Korea for its action. Nor and it, North Korea has, uh, you know, has shown attitude of no cooperation with anybody, uh, UN body, that it even voluntarily um, mm -hmm. ratified, for example, treaties and should um, go through the reviews of com committees that are monitoring the situation, you know, of this specific um, 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 kind of thematic uh, issues on the ground. And uh, they, they have been avoiding any cooperation with the UN for such a long mm -hmm. time. It was embarrassing for, for the states at some point to really uh, defend North Korea, um, especially after what has happened at the 2009 Universal, 2010 Universal Periodic Review, when North Korea was the only country that really rejected all of the recommendations, and states um, asked for a break and gathered in front of the red face um, DPRK ambassador to demand actions. And I remember that many states, for example, Brazil, who intentionally switched to abstention because Brazil thought the North Korean human rights um, resolution does not work and we have to give them a chance, mm. were very embarrassed by this attitude because how can you defend a country that does not want to show any goodwill mm -hmm. and you know denial is not a dialogue it's a one-way right. communication if you don't show that something is changing on the ground then what are we talking about what kind of engagement are mm -hmm. we talking about mm -hmm. and i think this is what has changed uh, in terms of international community however i don't think that china and russia are yet ready to push it as far that you know for example they would allow for uh, human rights resolution and referral, referral of the North Korean leadership to be referred actually to International Criminal Court. Mm -hmm. But we don't know what will happen because with North Korea's military action and how North Korea behaves, it might cause certain change. We never know, you know, in international relations, sometimes things happen and the countries have to respond immediately at that time. So keeping this agenda on the, on the, um, keep, keeping the issue on the agenda of the UN uh, Security Council is, that's why, very important. I see. Speaking of UN, maybe we can, we're nearing the end of time, but I'd like to hear from you, what's the, the UN's role in this? And uh, maybe the prospect of uh, international cooperation in the future, and if you can add some advices to that. Um, the, the UN's role in uh, monitoring and promoting uh, North Korean human rights are essential and decisive. Uh, in, in my view, um, um, the establishment of uh, United Nations Commission on Inquiry on North Korean Human Rights uh, 2012 and 2013 Actually, their work was uh, historic, and they have made a remarkable achievement uh, within one year to produce um, a comprehensive report on mm -hmm. the situation of North Korean human rights and have made a series of recommendations. And we are now following through the recommendations made by the COI. And uh, I think one thing uh, uh, is uh, remarkable is that the uh, international community uh, is uh, uh, getting to know much more uh, about uh, uh, the abysmal situation of North Korean human rights at the moment. And uh, they are getting more united uh, uh, to work together how to improve North Korean human rights situations. And uh, another point is that accountability, uh, which Joanna uh, once said, accountability, uh, accountability of North Korean human rights abuses mm. and violations are one of the key agenda items uh, at the moment in the United, United Nations, how we can uh, implement uh, the accountability questions in the future. Uh, mm. I think the international community is uh, uh, very concretely discussing uh, the how to enforce the ac accountability in the future. I see. Uh, while collecting, while collecting um, the cases of uh, mm. North Korean mm. human rights violations uh, through various channels. Yeah, in that sense, data collecting is very important. It's very important, yes. Right. Dr. Hosanyu, for the as a last word, what would be the kind of uh, priority items uh, in terms of uh, North Korean human rights issues that you would place? 
Uh, we have to link right now all the recommendations that have been laid out by the Commission of Inquiry and uh, make sure that both international community and South Korea want, works hand in hand on these issues. So whether these are agencies, UN agencies working inside the country, inside North Korea, they should be, uh, you know, upholding the uh, rights up front uh, doctrine by the Secretary General, knowing after Commission of Inquiry reports that uh, human rights violations are happening on the ground and they are there. So they should um, signal any uh, negative changes mm -hmm. to the outside world. Um, and also, you know, with in terms of UN, we just, um, in March 2016, my NGO was um, crucial in um, um, advocating for establishment of panel of experts on accountability. The panel will soon come to Seoul uh, mm -hmm. in, in just a few weeks and will lay out a strategy on, uh, of accountability both in terms of international community and our responsibility, but also in terms of South Korea as a uh, responsible player uh, and member of the international community, given the very peculiar legal situation in the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, UN views DPRK and South Korea as separate countries. However, according to South Korean constitution, it's a one country. Right. Theoretically, we can view that crimes against humanity have been conducted on our territory. Mm -hmm. We have to kind of, you know, step up our discourse to a completely different level of how we will deal with this situation in the future in South Korea. What can we do right now to the victims, 30,000 here in South Korea? Right now, per perpetrators and the victims are receiving the same policies mm, here. Mm. Uh, we have to, you know, look at the examples of countries, for example, in Central Europe, of how you have to deal with victims of uh, um, a large human rights violations. Mm, this mm. is what is South Korea's role, but will be also uh, supported by international community and especially UN field office here. Okay. And I hope NGOs can only contribute to this process. I see on the note. Okay. I thank you both for May, your, may, may, I, may I add one more thing? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> because this is a recorded interview. I, I, I uh, just would like to emphasize the role of NGOs uh, in, um, in, in, in the continuation of the United Nations activity to promote uh, North Korean human rights. Uh, the governmental, uh, governmental organization uh, have a certain limit limitations mm. to make a decision and to follow up a decision uh, made by uh, such organizations. But NGOs, uh, they have, uh, they have uh, limited resources available, but NGOs uh, in various fields uh, have, have uh, gone through a lot of achievements. Uh, and uh, the United Nations, uh, uh, when uh, moving forward for the protection and promotion of human rights in North Korea, United Nations organizations should work closely together with NGOs who are working also in, in the same field. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. A recent rise of high-level defection suggests that North Korean human rights issues are becoming more serious, even for the elite. Human rights abuses in the North Korea is not anything new, but the global community's focus on this issue provides a new front against the North Korean regime. Heightened awareness and international collaboration once again seem to be the necessary elements for any degree of success. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.